I've heard about a donkey brain and a horse winning, but I've never thought of an equine that can whine. Well, this week, farrier Robert Barnes takes us on a tour of a horse ranch where equines don't whine, but there are some excellent wines being served. We'll be horsing around the Bella Cavelli Winery in Solvang. Then animal communicator Candy Kane Cooper serves up some sweet insights from her book, Afterlife of Animals. After Afterlife, we're gonna run our buns off when we visit Buns in Goleta, California. These buns have long ears and soft fur, just like Bugs Bunny, but without the carrots. This will be an episode to bray about. So don't go away, we'll be right back. Today on Animal Zone, we're at the Belly Cavella Farms up in Solvang, California. And it's a beautiful day to be here. Beautiful and look day. at this gorgeous mare you've got next to you. She's came to say hi to us. Yeah. She loves, this is a thoroughbred, I believe. Yeah, she's got great And she just spots. had a baby. This mare just had a baby and he's about two years old. So this is one of the ranch horses and the baby's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Same color, same everything, but it's a boy. Oh. So he's a filly then, right? He, he's a colt. A colt, rather. So tell me a little bit about uh, where we are. Well, this is a farm that my friend uh, Jeff Lockwood from Santa Barbara developed. And Monty Roberts owned this farm probably 20 years ago. And Mr. Lockwood, uh, Jeff and Joanne Lockwood, took this over from him, actually bought it outright, and started rebuilding. So probably two or three years of construction just to get the facility going. Because Monty's, uh, farm Monty's is right across next to the it. street right here. Yeah, the flag, flag is, is up, up farms, farms is, is on the other side there. Sure. Right, the racetrack and all his pastures are directly across the farm there. So he's he's actually our neighbor and I see him every day. What a great neighbor. Oh, what the a horse whisperer, right? Unbelievable trainer, yeah. unbelievable, yeah. yes. So this was a breeding area. This then. was the breeding facility back in the 90s where I worked here and there was probably 120 head of thoroughbred mares and then in the barn here, there was 10 to 12 stallions that we bred regularly. So this is a really, really nice farm. It's like a foundation in the valley for mm. farms. So Bella Cavalli is probably the premier farm in San Ynez now, Solvang, the whole valley here, because it's all been remodeled and uh, the care here is unbelievable. Jeff and Joanne Lockwood are hands-on. They're out here. If they hear something at night, their home is here on the ranch. They can see everything. They hear something, they're out here. You know, when the mare foals, the wife Joanne Lockwood is there doing the foal imprinting. Wow. So I mean, no, how many they're... how many horses do they have? We can hold up to about 75 head. 60 is an easy number for mm -hmm. everybody. Once you get above that, it's hard to do top care. And and you have mares and stallions. Yeah. So the pastures go one, two, three, four, and then five, and then the racetrack. So the first. Uh, corral here will be all Jeff's private horses and then it goes into the boarding horses. Now beyond horses they are also in the wine business right and the beverage business. Yeah uh, Jeff Lockwood and Joanne have developed what they call Bella Cavalli Farms wine and that comes from his vineyard here of about he has probably about I don't know 20 acres and he does the rosé, chardonnay, sauvignon blanc all that all the good stuff. Does he do a mare low? He does do a Merlot. I got that. Thank you very much. <laughs> a Merlot, yeah. He also provides spirits. His brother, Jay Lockwood, mm -hmm. who is identical to Jeff, I think he might be a year or two older, is now developing their uh, liquor distillery. So they have two or three distilleries, and they distill vodka, whiskey, and all their own stuff. So this very, very, very wide span of businesses run through the farm here. Wow. And. Um, when you talk about making tequila, you have to have agave plants. Does he grow his own agave? You know, I think he buys his plants from uh, Mexico, but don't quote me on that. I'm just guessing that some of the fine, you know, because some of the best agave in the world is grown in... Tequila? Yeah. Yeah. It's grown in Mexico. Jole, I'm ready for a shooter. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we... Patron uh, is my favorite, so... Is it? Oh, yeah. You're not a... I would think you drink eek wine. Equine. That's, that's equine. <laughs> equine. Sorry. Okay, let's go take a look. Let's go take a look. <laughs> so here we are inside the stables, and uh, they're beautiful stables. Bella right? Cavalli Farms has not left anything out. Here we have a chandelier that Jeff put right in the middle of all of our cross ties, and I mean, this place is 
it, you could eat off the floor. Or drink off the floor. Or drink, We got a yeah. couple of his bottles of wine, and uh, this looks delicious. <laughs> Save this for after the shoot. <laughs> after the shoot, we'll have toast to the Bella Cavalli Farms in our program today. Now, I have a question for you about horses. Um, are, I've heard that horses, some people say horses are colorblind. But I understand maybe that's not really the case. They can see a few things, right? Yes, that's very interesting. As uh, we had talked about earlier, horses can see blues, greens, reds I don't think they see. So a carrot in an apple means nothing to them. Means huh? nothing to them. Green or brown. Except they know it tastes it's very sweet. So when they hear that apple or see that carrot, they're coming to you. Speaking of food, um, are horses uh, carnivores, uh, omnivores, or are they um, uh, herbivores? I think they're herbivores because they eat grass strictly, hay, yeah. and they're not carnivores. So yeah, they're her a herbivore. I guess their teeth are kind of, uh, they, they, gr they grind things, but they don't exactly. really tear things. They grind things down. So the grass in the pastures got a lot of moisture in it, so it's very easy to palate and chew. Drier stuff, they have difficult processing, so a lot of people will soak their hay. That helps the horse process mm -hmm. through the stomach and add weight. And maybe one of the things that people aren't sure about or don't realize is that horses have emotions and feelings, right? Very correct, very correct. I mean, how you've worked around horses all your life. How do you know what a horse is thinking or feeling? Well, their eyes tell you a lot and obviously they can't speak, so that's always a problem. So it's either their eyes and their ears their facial expressions, the way they react to your body language. Your body language means a lot to them. When you come up to them and you're aggressive, they very standoffish. Mm. So it's body language, you know. And so when you approach a horse for the first time, are there any techniques? Always very kind of keep your shoulders down, your head down, don't make eye contact because that's a challenge. When you meet eye contact with the horse, you're challenging that horse to fight. So you do not, you know, especially on a horse that has issues, mm -hmm. a horse that's scared and wide-eyed that horse you don't look at in the face, you just touch his shoulder and rub him and talk very, very quietly. No loud noises, no sudden movements. When their muzzle comes up and they start sniffing you and rubbing their nose on your, on they're, your they're, they're saying hello. Is that how they say that's hello? That's how they say hello. Wow, that's pretty great. How do they say goodbye? <laughs> Usually turn around and tear off at a dead <laughs> run, and that means we're done. Oh, well, I hate to say it, but we got to say goodbye. We got to say goodbye. We've been here. What another great day at Bella Cavalli Farms, Salvan, California, and I'm glad you guys could come out. Thank you, Robert. It's been a real treat us. today. That's real always treat a today. pleasure to be with real you. Real treat today. Arthur. I'll drink to that. Yeah, we'll go and try this out here and see if it's as good as it looks. And we may be right back. Today on Animal Zone, we've got a very special guest, Candy Kane Cooper, who's the author of a new book called Afterlife of Animals. And I can tell you, this is a great book, Candy. I, I read this book from cover to cover, and I feel better after reading it. Was Good. that your goal? Yes, that's the goal. I'm so glad. I mean, you're, you're an internationally known communicator with animals. Yes. And you've helped so many people deal with grief, deal with the transitions that take place in life. How did this start? When did you first be able to communicate with an animal? Well, it all started when I was very young. Uh, people always ask me that question. I was born this way, and uh, I realized it very, very young when I was about three years old with the incident I had with my first dog, Seymour. Yeah, what happened? Uh, well, uh, one, one night he was out back, and I think he was out back. Actually, I'm not quite sure where he was, but I heard him in my mind yeah. crying and screaming. I ran into my parents' bedroom to tell them that something was wrong with Seymour. And they said, we, you're, you're having a nightmare. We haven't heard anything. Seymour's fine, darling. Go back to bed. You're just having a bad dream. Mm -hmm. uh, but I knew that I had hurt him in dire pain. So of course, like a good girl, I went back to bed. And the next morning, I got up, and he was very, very ill. He had kidney failure and rushed to the hospital and we had to euthanize him. Mm. And after that happened, even though I was so young, I was thinking to myself, why was it that I heard him screaming at the top of his lungs and my parents did not? Mm -hmm. And I was with my very best friend since I'm actually three years old uh, on Sunday. And she said, I remember we used to talk about this when we were little and I, I didn't even remember talking to uh, Lisa about it. 
uh -huh. but she had mentioned it and that was kind of like, wow, I keep learning new things about even myself as a child when I discovered this. So you were hearing this as a, vo as a it's voice? It's a voice, it, yes. Uh, speaking in a language or how, how do you? English, just like we're talking. Yeah, yeah every animal has their own uh, you know, voice, the way they speak, their patterns, the speech patterns. Right. They're all different, just now, like every one of us. So if you get a French bulldog, are you gonna parler français? <laughs> well, <laughs> for some, when it, when it translates somehow, you know, it comes to me in my, uh, my native language, which is English. Mm -hmm. But I have had animals speak to me in Spanish uh, and French, which I understand a little bit of. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I was like, well, you know, I, I need English. And then I, it's because I talk to animals all over the world. Right. So, yeah. yes, I hear their voice. I'm very different in that way than most communicators. They, they don't have the audio. So is communication with an animal, is that a gift or is it a trained ability? Absolutely, it's not trained. Uh, I'm asked all the time to teach, you know, to give seminars on it. I wouldn't even know how to begin to teach it. Mm -hmm. uh, I have found, though, through the years, Arthur, some of my clients that, with, that have been with me for a long time, or I have several that I talk to their animals every single day. Wow. Yeah, um, I'm very close with not only their animals, but their human caretakers, and they have developed somewhat of the skill, opening up. Well, I noticed in your book you have a, a, a section that deals with being more receptive yes. to uh, what your animals who have passed over yes. are, are, are trying to communicate and you use meditation as yes. a method to try and center yourself. Right, because when you're in that state, uh, you know, that delta state, your conscious mind is completely relaxed and your subconscious takes over and opens up. And if your animal is going to come to you at any time, that's usually I mean, for the average person, when they're going to hear it because they're relaxed. All right. All right. I want to yeah. I want to talk about the Rainbow Bridge. Okay. But we got to take a break. Okay. We take so a break. we're going to go over the the break bridge. Okay. <laughs> and when we come back, we'll find out about the Rainbow. All one, right. Okay? Sounds good. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Well, we're back here on Animal Zone with Candy Kane Cooper, the author of Afterlife of Animals, and talking about maybe one of the more challenging things that happens to us in life, and that's when we say goodbye to our pets, at least temporarily on the physical plane. But there's something that you talk about, and which I've heard often, a thing called the Rainbow Bridge, yes. which sounds beautiful. I, I, I've <laughs> seen rainbows, but I've never seen a bridge that you could walk across. Right. What's it, is it really a rainbow? Uh, no, not really. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not really a rainbow, it's not really a bridge, and uh, it's not really where you've heard people say they go into the light. Yeah. I mean, maybe the humans do, but when I transition with the animals, uh, I, there's no light. Uh, basically, it's we're here at, in this present, you know, plane, reality, dimension, and then as soon as the body shuts off, the spirit leaves immediately and transitions to the other side. Mm -hmm. And it is beautiful, though. It is beautiful. And I mean, I've been many, many places on the other side. I mean, it's just like we see it here, right. but it's all natural. There's no buildings, obviously, or cars, or, you know. No taxes? No taxes. I want to go, Tell but not right away. Sign me up. I mean, personally, I can't wait to transition myself, and it's amazing. Well, that's, that's such encouraging news. It is. Uh, although I can wait a little while longer. <laughs> okay, yeah, a little bit longer. But, you know, I mean, I've often heard when people pass, they go through this the tunnel, tunnel, they see a white light. Yeah. I mean, even my, my grandmother, who mm -hmm. uh, had a heart attack, and was at a point where she was dead. Oh, was she? And uh, she said that she was she floating above her body. Yes, floating looking, above the looking body. Looking at herself. Yes. And seeing the doctors going crazy yes. trying to bring her back. And she was trying to tell them, no, leave, let me go, let me go. Wow. She got up through this light. And then on the other side, there were all these flowers. She said there was, oh, it was just like the most incredible gardens that she's ever seen. The colors are brilliant. Yeah. Everything is And amplified. she was so happy. And she yeah. was so at one with life. Right. Or death, as the case may be. But then all of a sudden she felt this thing pulling her back, and oh, and, and then she came and back. And then she came back, and she didn't want to come back. She's, and they said, "No, you're 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 not done yet." I love that story. So that that sort of this that was early on. I heard yeah. that when I was probably ten or eleven years wow. old. But uh, what I'm curious about is, you, you say that when you see this transition taking place, you feel electricity or a tingling. Yes. Can you tell me what that is? Yes. When I first started doing uh, assisted euthanasia. 
it was a little scary for me because I wasn't sure, you know, uh, what I was feeling, but I have several close vets that I work with that I, I love them, mm -hmm. that I'm able to bounce the uh, scientific side of it, you right. know, off of them or things that I'm feeling, I can call them and I can talk to them. I mean, I love my therapist, I even thank her in my book, but for the spiritual side that keeps mm -hmm. me going and keeps me grounded. But then there's also the scientific side of it is what is actually happening. And yeah, I get this crazy tingling feeling and it starts, you know, usually they do the catheter in the animal's leg or their arm. So when the IV starts with a second, second injection after they're relaxed, you know, I feel it move through my body, but actually I'm feeling it in their body because when I'm reading, whatever the animal's feeling, I'm feeling it in my body. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's you know, right. meshing. Uh, so I'm feeling it through my body, travel up, and then it goes right up through to the top of my head, and then we cross. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way that it was explained to me is that it's, you know, we're all, we're all electricity. Right. All of us, every living thing. Right. So, so is it, then you're saying that the soul is maybe not necessarily just this entity that's walking around, it's more of a, a energy. Energy. Right? It is energy. It's energy that it just energy. can flow and that flow. meshes with other energies. That's that right. We all are one universal mind. Oh, that's great. We all, that's how I explain what I do, because otherwise I have no clue, Arthur. Right. <laughs> right. Oh. I don't even know. It's amazing, to, even to me. I've got no, no idea. Right. But um, so when the energy is ready to move on and the body dies, then it's set free. And mm -hmm. it's the release of that, of, of the spirit or the energy, whatever you want to call it, your ki, mm -hmm. your chi. Right. People have different names and different religions for it, but right. it's all the same thing. Hannah, it has been such a pleasure oh, meeting you. Thank and you. I love your book. And thank I hope you are, sir. everybody will make sure to get hold of this book, read it. It will give you great hope and great uh, optimism about uh, the future. <laughs> oh, I'm, that means everything to me. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Animal Zone. Well, today on Animal Zone, we're at a very special place called Buns. And we're with Kimmy Swan, the president of Buns. And what exactly does Buns mean? Bunnies urgently needing shelter. Oh, that's easy to know. <laughs> and who is this in your lovely This office? is Mac Daddy, little dwarf, little Netherland dwarf. Uh-huh. How, do you have any idea how old uh, Mac Daddy About two-ish. And how long do bunnies last? You know, the average is eight to 10, but I had one pass away a few years ago at 16, so they can live longer. Wow. I mean, it, he looks perfectly content yeah, in your arms. very. He's a very easy boy. Well, that, that's the thing. I mean, do bunnies make good pets? Excellent. They're quiet. They don't smell. <laughs> yeah. They're excellent pets. And they can use litter boxes like cats? They are absolutely litter box trained, most of them. Right. Not all, but yes. Oh, I'm hearing some bunnies barking. I didn't know they barked like dogs. <laughs> We are right next door to the dogs at the county animal shelter, so it is a little loud in here at times. How does that work for the bunnies? Do they handle it? You know, in the beginning, they get pretty stressed by it, but then over time, they adjust, and it's almost like white noise to them, I, we believe. When did buns start? Started in 1992. Uh -huh. Started with a single carrier in this area, and it's grown since then. And. How many bunnies do you think you've adopted out? Four to five thousand. Wow, that's a lot of rabbits. Yeah. And um, and are they mostly adopted locally, or do they go out of state? Uh, how Most, far afield? Mostly locally. They mostly are. Santa Barbara County. Yeah. You know, we like to adopt county-wise, of course, outside the county once in a while, but majority of the time it's in the county. I see. Wow. For people who are watching, they might live in a place where they see a wild bunny in their yard. Is that something worth adopting or someone we should bring here or just leave them alone? Leave them alone. They are usually cottontails or wild rabbits of that region and rabbits are the prey to all the predators so they actually serve a purpose. You don't want to touch them, they'll never let you near them and if they do, they're probably sick. Uh -huh. So you can call wild rehabilitators but you want to leave them alone. What, ab what about if you see a nest of little bunny, little tiny baby bunnies? Uh, leave them. Because even if the mom's not there, you, you don't have to worry about 
that they've been abandoned? Well, moms only nurse them twice a day. So majority of the time the mom will come around. If you're worried, call the wild rehabilitators in your area and they can help you through the process. Okay. Majority of the time they're not abandoned. Huh. I wouldn't abandon this one. <laughs> no. Look at that little face. It's so cute. What are the varieties of bug, uh, bunnies that are out there? Or most popular? Most popular would be the dwarfs, definitely. Um, lops, Holland lop with the ears down. Uh -huh. And you know, everybody has their own preference. There's that really big rabbit, the one of the, the like the major rabbit. The Flemish giants. Is that what that is? Continental giants. How yeah. big do they get and how much do they weigh? Up to 25 pounds that I've seen. What about uh, the differences between, because you also have guinea pigs here. Yes. So what's the difference between a rabbit and a guinea pig? One is a lagomorph and a guinea pig is a rodent. Oh, and they eat different things, I assume. Same stuff? Same stuff. Herbivores. So like fresh greens, vegetables, carrots? Hay. <laughs> lots and lots of hay. Their number one is hay or grass to their diet. Right. And vegetables is their dinner. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. And treats is every other moment. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and he's available, right? He's available. For this is Mac Daddy. He is available for adoption. If people want to get in touch with buns, uh, do they get through the website too? Absolutely. www.bunsbunsb.org. And of course, you're always welcoming volunteers and donations. We are completely volunteer you're oriented. you're 501c3. We are right? 501c3, yep. Well, Kimmy, it's great work you're doing here. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for looking after these wonderful creatures. They really are adorable, <laughs> and we appreciate it. Thank you so much. All I think right. he was happy through this. Okay, great. We're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we've got more Animal Zone coming right up. Weren't those some amazing four-footed creatures? And they're two-footed caretakers. Those of you who adopt and foster rescue animals, you're the real heroes. And you know what? Those animals give you the greatest gift of all, the gift of unconditional love. If you want to know more about animal adoptions and animal experts, please go to our website, animalzone.org, and I hope you'll join us next time, right here on Animal Zone. Never was a friend so true. Never was a friend like you. Canine, you're my best friend. Canine of mine, friend for all time. So glad you're my best friend. Through thick and thin, we'll see things through. Canine of mine, so true. Did I find you or did you find me? Either way, it's still serendipity. When I saw you, it was plain to see. You weren't just another lassie, wanna be your oh, canine of mine. Friend for all time. I'm so glad you're my best friend.